Kira, and I'm currently a senior at Stanford, majoring in computer science. Uh, but I'm also really passionate about classical Indian dance, which has been something that I've been learning for the past 15 years. And today I wanted to share my passion and just a little bit more about the art form with all of you. So I'm calling this Beyond Bollywood um, because I'm going to start off, I guess, uh, how many of you, I guess, what do you know about Indian dance? I would love to kind of hear from the audience what common... Nothing. <laughs> All right, that's a good response. Um, how many of you have heard of Bollywood? Yeah. So I think that's definitely a um, very popular association of entertainment with India. Uh, we've definitely all probably seen some kind of Bollywood films, um, very vibrant dancing and singing. But today I want to talk to you a little bit about the diversity of Indian dance forms. You might be familiar with the fact that in India there are several different distinct languages, distinct states, and there are actually as many dance forms as there are languages and states. In fact, classical dance in India is very prominent. When I say classical, I mean a dance form similar to ballet in the sense that it takes about seven years to reach a performance level, and then there's a lifetime of learning that can be done in terms of just improving it. And different regions of India have very distinct forms of classical dance. For example, in North India, we see Kathak. Uh, this dance form is characterized by a lot of pirouettes. The dance form or pose is primarily standing, whereas in East India, we see Odissi, which is a lot more graceful so every region of India has a very different kind of form of classical dance. In South India, there are many different forms of classical dance. This particular dance form is very theatrical. The dancers often wear masks and ex very heavy makeup, and shows go on sometimes for 24 to 48 hours. The form of dance I do is called Bharatnatyam, which is more popular, and it's also from South India. I'll talk a little bit about the history of Bharatnatyam. It started off as a temple dance. Originally, in the temples, there would be the priests who would be chanting and saying prayers, but dance was also a way of worshipping. So people would often dance devotional songs to the gods in the temple. So that's where the dance form started. And because of that, it has a lot of spiritual and mythological references. But since then, it's involved into what we see as a modern performing art form. And in fact, a lot of dancers have used it to express contemporary themes. For example, there was recently a pretty fun ballet on Don Quixote in which uh, they actually use the grammar of classical Indian dance to express these concepts. So it's become a very versatile art form, and now it's done both in a group setting as well as in a solo setting. And now I'll talk a little bit about the dance form itself. It has two main aspects to it. The first is technique. It's called nirtha, and this is what you might think of as pure movement its actual dance. And the second aspect is expression or abhinaya. And this is what makes Indian dance somewhat unique in the sense that there's actually a huge vocabulary dancers can use to express stories and ideas. And as you can imagine, this was very useful in the original setting when this was an art form done in temples. And dancers often would praise the beauty of the god whom they were praying to, and so on and so forth, using these expressional emotional gestures. So a little bit more about the technique aspect itself. There's a lot of intricate footwork, a lot of different postures. Dancers dance to specific rhythmic syllables that are vocally percussed. And they uh, do these movements in different rhythmic gates. The main rhythmic gates are gates of three, four, five, seven, and nine. And they learn about 70 to 80 basic movements. And then later on, these movements are strung into choreographies that they perform. So it takes about three to four years to learn the steps, and then another 
several years to learn the choreographies themselves. So I'll give a little bit of a demonstration here so that you can better understand what some of these steps look like. Um, yeah, so to start off with, how about all of you, you can clap along with me. I'm going to do a step in a cycle of four. I'm going to say the syllables out loud, and then I'm going to dance the step. So um, we can all just go one, two, three, four. The syllables are going to be something like da, da, drum, da, di, da, drum, da, di, da, da, Thank you for keeping my rhythm. <laughs> um, if I do that in a cycle of three, it would look something like one, two, three. Another example of how the same step can be done in different rhythms and it can have a different flavor. And the syllables I'm saying with my beat, the ki, da, they don't really have a meaning. They're just meant to emulate the syllables of a drum. So that's kind of the vocal percussive aspect of the art form. Um, now a bit about the expressional aspect. There's a set of hand gestures that dancers also learn, much like the steps, often around 50 to 60 different ones. And these are used to depict pieces of poetry and do interpretive dance or storytelling. For example, one gesture in all of these gestures is alapadmam, and this can be used to show a flower. It can be used to show the sun rising and it can also be used to show birth. So just one gesture can have a lot of different meanings. And I can string all of these together to illustrate concepts or ideas. For example, I may, might say something like, one day I was at my window and I was looking outside and I noticed it was raining. And then I also saw deers jumping and I saw flowers blooming. And then I looked down the road and I saw someone coming. And as I see that person, I realize that's my friend. And now I open the door and now we talk. So that might be an example of how these gestures are used to express these concepts and ideas. And they can be used to express everything from Little Red Riding Hood <laughs> to, um, to concepts about Indian gods and goddesses. So now I'll do a little bit of an actual choreography that's a little bit more complex. Um, I'll just do a couple minutes. And yeah, it'll be to some recorded music. <laughs> and it's an excerpt from a larger piece about the god of dance. Yeah. 
that was an example of, um, <clears throat> excuse me, a more complex choreography that, um, that someone might learn. And a typical performance would be a lot of choreographies like this um, strung together. So one thing I've realized through doing dance is that art is a very powerful medium of connection. Um, and I've been able to leverage that to do a lot of social and educational outreach. I founded Art U, a nonprofit that promotes awareness of classical and cultural art forms and also educates minorities about STEM topics through art-themed curriculum. So it's actually been a great way to impact youth nationwide, um, educate them about these classical and cultural art forms that are a little bit more rare and ultimately provide a platform for you to connect through art. And if you're interested in learning more, I would love to talk with you later. Um, ultimately, I really love this quote from Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> music and magic beyond all we do here. I think art of any kind is that way. It's a magic beyond everything that we can do. And it's a magic that helps us connect with people around us. And that's something that I really want to leave all of you with today to think about the magic that you can do with art or whatever else you're really passionate about. Thank you. <laughs>
or like giving giving intuition about topics that are later difficult or confusing like to what how how much can you get in there yeah 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 that's a great question one thing that we actually do is they're very complex <laughs> rhythms in Bharatanatyam so just like those cycles I was talking about, but it gets even more complex when you try to figure out if you're composing a rhythmic pattern, it all has to fit into certain measures and certain cycles. So that's a great way to introduce students to math. So that's one basic way that we do it. Um, we also do, we also use a lot of other, um, the expressive part of Bharatanatyam is very good for teaching people like humanities, for example. Um, <clears throat> I found myself oftentimes when emoting these poems, it's like interpreting Shakespeare. There's so many ways you can interpret one line, so many interpretations you can have, and that's also a great way of teaching kids about like English too. So um, we use <laughs> Bharatanatyam to do a little bit of like teaching about math, <clears throat> but we also use a lot of other art forms, for example, kids like building different animals in an ecosystem with clay and we, we do a lot of like different modules and outreach that way too as well. Yeah. Cool, thank you.